you know, teams want to raise their game. And I think that uh, for us, the Autumn Internationals was, was great, you know, to finish against New Zealand as we did, but um, it's added a bit of pressure. You know, we were where Scotland are, are now, you know, six, well, sorry, a year ago, um, England was a, it was a new team. Obviously, you know, the sort of debacle of the World Cup was over and done with and Stuart Lancaster picked up a team. No one had a lot of, a lot of faith and the guys worked extremely hard and, and you know, obviously culminating in, in a good victory against New Zealand. So for us, um, we want to keep that momentum. But, you know, Scotland, are, I think they're making comments in the newspapers already and everything else is, is a team we will never get drawn into that because we respect them. You know, Scotland are big players, strong players. They've got a lot of, a lot of dangerous guys in their, in their side. And, and if those of you are, who are rugby aficionados know that Dean Ryan, you know, he's a guy that um, made a career out of being very, very physical on the field. So these guys are going to come to Twickenham to have a massive fight. And as a team, if you're going to start Six Nations, there's no better team to play against than Scotland. And with Wales not in the best of form, people are, are rating England's chances quite highly. Does that add pressure or does it just, just motivate you more? Yeah, of course it adds pressure. I think that... Uh, you know, there's two worlds. There's the rugby world that, that I inhabit, and there's the world that the, the the media and everyone else portray. And we don't get carried away with statistics. We don't look at teams like Wales and go, "Oh, they're not performing," because it's it's really irrelevant. If you know, sort of in professional sport, anything that's gone before, there's obviously always a bit of a form guide. But to be fair, anyone can beat anyone on the day. You know, how many people gave England any credit in that game against New Zealand? Um, how many people thought we, you know, take South Africa to a to a one, you know, to a to a, to a one point loss? those things don't really um, come about. So for Wales, I wouldn't believe anything you read about Wales. I wouldn't believe anything you read in the press. I mean, I'm not a big fan of reading the press in, in general because when you know people and you see what they write and then you read them and you just go, I don't know how they get away with making stuff up. Um, but uh, certainly with Wales, I think they're going to be very, very um, dangerous. They've got, again, some big guys and Rob Howley and uh, Sean Edwards are going to want to make sure they hit the ground running. On the, in contrast, France on the back of quite a good run. Are they up there with the England as the favourites? Yeah, the, the France, uh, the French for me are um, a really interesting. I mean, they're an interesting race, you know, having lived there and everything else. Um, but they're, they're, it's really, especially in terms of professional sport, because on, on the day, I believe France can beat anyone. But you never know what team's going to turn up. Um, I mean, I played in, in Stade Francais for two years, and some days the guys would drop. 40, 50 balls in training, like ridiculous, like you've never seen anything like it, and then they play unbelievable on the weekend. They'd be on fire, um, and then, you know, then in the training week, we have an unbelievable training week, Everything's, everything goes according to plan, and they just don't turn up. And, and that's, the, the, that's the thing for, for a French team, is if they can control that passion and emotion, because in France back in the day, you play eight games a season, you know, you could bang heads, scream, you know, make each other cry. I mean, they love a cry over in France, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand, but they spend a lot of time crying. It's all about the passion. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes they lose their heads. That's why you, you see some bizarre things, you know, fighting each other or knocking each other out. Like, I mean, there was a bizarre thing in, in Stade Francais where Pascal Pape and a prop would always headbutt each other. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not one for, for doing too much of that, but these guys would actually headbutt each other. It was pretty, pretty horrendous. Um, but they'd also do that out on the piss as well, which I don't really get either. I'm not a big man for, for, for man games. So, yeah, they were always trying to headbutt me, so I was swerving at all, at all times. Any funny stories about any of your current teammates along those lines? Um, what, my England team or front? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of characters in, in the team. Um, I mean, Chris Ashton's one. Um, he's, he's, uh, he's unbelievable. Um, he's actually just had his teeth done, so I used to get into him a lot about his teeth. They look like a bag of smashed crabs, or they've been thrown in from a distance, but actually he... Um, <laughs> He, he's had them done now. He wears these two braces at all times. So he, yeah, he's got proper, you know, corrected teeth. He still needs a suntan. Um, he, you know, obviously when he takes his shirt off, you can't tell he's got the England shirt on or he hasn't got it on. <laughs> and you can, you can actually see his heart pumping through his chest, which is quite bizarre. Um, but he's, he's a good guy. You've got, you've got Danny Kerr. You know, he, um, he, he, you know he's, a, he's, a, he's a top guy. Um, I was having a bit of banter on, I don't know if, uh, how many of you guys are on Twitter and stuff, but um, it's a bit difficult, obviously, the world we live in now with... Um, expressing yourself out in public but Danny and I spent the Sunday afternoon just getting into each other and I culminated you know I've always Danny's a very good looking guy um, and a lot of women always find him attractive but he's held back by the fact he's not the tallest guy you know because women always say I want tall dark and handsome they never say I want small dark and handsome um, so on my culminated with the picture I sent was a dancing dwarf holding a Jaeger bottle because um, Danny's supposed to not drink anymore so Oh, um, and what is a typical day moving on to, you know, you talked about the training week and the build-up to a game like at the weekend. 
just run us through your, sort of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how that changes as a game approaches. Uh, yeah, I mean the week, the rugby players week, you know, pretty much stays the same. The skeleton or the spine of the week stays the same. Um, you know, this week we, we had a camp last week. We had Saturday, Sunday off, which is quite nice to have a bit of rest because you're going into it. Uh, Monday, we, we started the day with our units um, set up. So we spend a lot of time working on our set piece and our scrum in the morning. Go and have lunch in the afternoon. We've got a, a rugby session, which will be quite attack based. Um, you know, when I was out in the, in the Super 15, the big things I noticed between training sessions were um, was a lot more ball in hand stuff. You know, in England, there's a lot more, well, not in England's squad now, but in England in general, there was a lot more focus on speed and power um, and that gym time and sort of practicing the, the you know, mauling and, and all that kind of things. Where in New Zealand, a lot of it was team based stuff. So you would have guys who'd come in, show you a video of how they wanted to play, say, this is the the key bits we're going to add this week and then you would go out and do it on a fi sort of a 15 on 15 format and that's kind of what we do with England on a Monday. Tuesday today is the big day actually. Um, I'm, lucky, I'm lucky I'm here, I made it through, this is our big contact day um, and we had uh, sort of our forward stuff again this morning where we, we ramped things up a little bit in the afternoon we then have a, our bigger rugby session um, which is sort of all the contact. I mean I literally to get here this evening I ran off the field <laughs> still kitted up, got in the car and was driving past everyone else leaving the um, Leaving the train for with my head down, so um, you know I don't know where they think I am this evening. But um, <laughs> don't answer that. It could be a multitude of, my, <laughs> could be a multitude of answers. Um, so yeah, and then oh, tomorrow is a day off. Thursday will be um, again a little bit of like power in the morning with a, with a, with a final rugby session. Friday we, it's always a good day. You know, Friday you get up, you go to Twickenham, and for anyone who um, has been there, you know it's such a great stadium. You know, I played there when I was. Um, 15 um, in the, um, or it's actually 14 in, in the Daily Mail under 15s Cup. And I never wanted to be a rugby player. I never really watched rugby. I, I remember dad mainly falling asleep to watching rugby in the afternoon after a few beers and, and me coming in and wondering what was going on on the TV, but, but never uh, paid too much attention to it. And I got a chance to play in the Daily Mail Cup, got a run out of Twickenham, and just the whole experience being in the changing rooms, being on the field, having that massive, all encompassing stadium. Um, makes a difference. So when we go out there and the fact you've got free reign, you kind of feel a little bit big time, even though you're supposed to be there. You kind of feel that, you know, you, you, you walk in and out of the changing room, you're going around, you're training on the field. And we do a team run that goes on probably for half an hour. Then the rest of the afternoon we've got off and um, they let us eat chocolate on Friday, which is the big, uh, the big thing. They supply us with our own chocolate brownies. Um, so everyone sort of, get, it feels a bit like, you know, like prep school or something like that. But they let us, um, they let us have the, the, the chocolate and then we have a few meetings. We normally have a shirt presentation. That's something that Stuart Lancaster's brought in. And we've had some amazing people present the shirts. You know, we've had guys like Jamie Peacock, Kevin Sinfield, rugby league legends. We've had um, ex-players of the game like Will Carling um, come in and give these shirt presentations and just explain a little bit what it means to be putting on that shirt, what they, what they see. For example, Jamie Peacock before the New Zealand game came in and talked about physicality. Now, anyone who watches rugby league and watches him, He's all about physicality, and he very famously talks about a game where he played um, played across the Australians. Or and, and every time he got the ball, he'd look up, and there'd be a brick wall in front of him, or a metaphorical brick wall. He'd be looking up, and, he'd, and he'd, he, his option was he could try and run around it, but he picked the biggest guy out in the team, and he ran at him. And he's, you know, he must have run at him about ten or eleven times. And he probably got smashed about eight or nine times. But the one time he kept running out, he got through, and they scored a try. And it was just his sort of, you know, physical attitude of being able to hit someone, get back. You know, it's not about talking a good game, it's about imposing yourself. And, and he, he was really impressive to listen to. So that's our, that's our week. And then on Saturday we go out to Twickenham and hopefully we get the win. And when you are training that intensively, this might sound a bit of an odd question, do you get bored of rugby? Do you wish you were somewhere else? And, or does your passion for, for playing kind of stay strong even through that? Yeah, you do get a little bit, um, you know, sometimes. If you imagine we've got 30 games a season, um, I think when you're on England duty, you, you, you never get bored because it's a new environment. Um, you know, you haven't, there's a lot of guys you don't see. So, you know, like, like anyone knows, when a group of 30 lads get together, you know, there's always a lot of banter flying around and guys have um, <laughs> a lot of sniggering at the back. Um, <laughs> and they have, uh, you know, they sort of, we have that camaraderie and stuff, which is really enjoyable. Um, but there are times when you know, you're running out, uh, uh, you know, at Wasp Train in Acton. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to Acton, but it's not going to win any, like, tourist awards or anything else like that. Um, and, you know, Wasps, I, I left Wasps, you know, about five years ago, and I've turned back up, and it's, and it's still a little bit ghetto around there. So I, um, so you run out there, sometimes it's freezing cold, wet, and you think, I bet there's 10 million other things I could be doing. But then you talk to other people who do the other things, and they're always saying, well, how lucky you are to be doing what you love. And to be fair, I, I realise that, and what's a bit of pain for an hour, 
to be outside, to come back in where you're, a lot of guys are stuck at a desk all day and never get the, uh, the goal at the end of the week. On the topic of banter, what's the best prank you've ever seen play in, in a rugby changing? I mean, there's a couple of, uh, I don't know really, I'll say in front of my mum here, but there's, um, there's, there's, a few, there's a few ones where um, Rafael Ibanez um, got, got very upset with um, Phil Vickery. Um, they kept having a, an eye with Phil Vickery, kept getting into to, to Rafael Ibanez. And um, Raf threatened him and he said to him, listen, you know, Phil, you just want to calm down, you're doing a little bit too much. And uh, Phil's like, no, 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 no. Gloucester Mute didn't listen to him. So, um, it suddenly all went quiet. You know, Raf didn't say any more to, to, to Phil. That's obviously a very dangerous thing when someone's not saying. Two weeks later from the scene, Phil Vickery's unpacking his bag and finds a shit in the bottom of his, <laughs> uh, bottom of his bag that he hadn't realised was in there. But the fact that it happened two weeks oh. earlier either shows that Phil Vickery never emptied his bag. Um, and that was pretty, that was pretty impressive. Um, <laughs> one of the boys, we had academy boys, like we used to put like, you know, dumbbells in their bags, toilet seats. That kind of thing, so they get home with <laughs> toilet seats, yeah. But actually, to be fair, now they don't, there isn't a lot, of, a lot of pranks going on, you know. We're sort of, like the rest of the world's gone very PC. No bullying, I love you, you love me, we're all friends together. It's, um, <laughs> it's the same as, it's the same as the rugby environment now. A lot of guys escape, you know. Did Phil Vickery get his revenge? I don't actually know what he did to do to, I think he let down Raf's tyres on his car, um, which is always, which is always the, 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 the go-to. But I'm, I'm trying to think of that, I mean, no, the French, the French, yeah, they had a fascination with doing stuff with, with shit as well, like in terms of <laughs> stitching people up. Like one of the guys took his boots out for a game, put his foot in the boot and someone shit in his boot, oh. um, which was a little bit, um, which was obviously a little bit inappropriate. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I, you know, I've come into the changing room when I was a bit younger and um, looked at where my kit was, couldn't find it, and it's been gaffer taped to the ceiling um, or cocooned in so much strapping that it takes you about an hour to get it out. So yeah, there, there, there's those old old favourites that they wheel out from now and then. You see our rugby players jotting down a few ideas there. Um, if we didn't come from me, okay, didn't come from me. <laughs> if we just go back a bit, James, to your, to your career, to your club career more so earlier, you've obviously slightly unusual in, compared to some players that you've played all around the world. How different was it playing in those leagues as opposed to England and how different between those different countries, Japan, New Zealand, France and then obviously the UK? Well, I mean, I started my career at um, Wasps, you know, as a fan first and foremost. You know, I talked about not being massively into rugby, and when I played at Twickenham, that sort of sparked that that thing that I wanted to get involved, and that coincided with my, my father taking me down to watch um, London Wasps play, and it was great. We used to play at Loftus Road, and every week, without fail, I'd go and watch it. It was, like, you know, I'd take friends down, and, and I, I became a massive Wasps fan. Um, and the beauty of, uh, of being at rugby as opposed to football is you actually get to meet your heroes. At football, you're kept at arm's length. You know, you're very rarely ever going to get to meet them unless you're in a corporate box or whatever. Um, but at rugby, you know, if you went to a bar, the players were taken round um, and you would meet them. And I became the biggest rugby noors known to man. Uh, there's a, you know, Joe Worsley. Um, I must have got that Joe Worsley and Lawrence Lallier's autographs, you know, uh, ad nauseum. And I had loads of them. I had, Ke you know, Kenny Logan, all these guys. And, and Joe Worsley always tell, tells us this, this story of when he was standing there and he'd be in the bar. And Josh Lee should be standing next to him. We're like, oh. And he was telling me this, uh, and he said to me, um, oh no, there's that fucking big nosed kid coming over. He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna start asking about rugby um, and what I'm eating and everything else like that. And I was saying, Joe, well, you must have been getting nosed off by a big nosed kid. Who was that? And he goes, it was fucking you. <laughs> every week, every week. What do I eat? How do you do it? How can I be like you? And, and yeah, and Lawrence, I mean, poor Lawrence, I must have nosed him off. Um, <laughs> You know, every, every week as well, just asking them all sort of questions. So I had that um, experience of being a Wasps fan, and then the opportunity to go and play with Wasps when I was 17. I was still at school, and I did a, a pre-season, um, including um, two or three games with them. Um, so for a 17-year-old to go and do that, you know, was 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 a big deal for me because um, a lot of guys had just had summer holidays off, um, and I was, you know, I was being basically a professional rugby player, and it was a bit weird because it kind of spoiled school rugby for me because then I had to go back. Um, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I was, a be I was uh, better than the school, but it just meant you're used to such different standards and um, that kind of different intensity that I wanted to enjoy my last year of rugby, you know, still playing around. I probably over overthought things a little bit. Um, and then sort of going into WASP, getting involved with them uh, was, was, yeah, was amazing. And uh, when my contract came up, I was dealing with two years of contract negotiation. And the problem is, again, what I talked about what people see in the newspapers, is people see, oh, you know, James Hassel's made a decision to go to Stade Francais, um, 
you know, they say money orientation or they, they talk about whatever, but in actual fact, for two years I was looking to negotiate with WASP. I wanted to stay. You know, it was my child, it was my sort of boyhood club, and, and I was very indoctrinated by WASPs. You know, they had great coaches, Warren Gatlin and Sean Edwards. I mean, they're fantastic, and, and I think if it wasn't for WASPs, I wouldn't be here today. I think if I'd gone to, to a Leicester and everything else like that, I don't think they would have coped with my personality and my nature, um, and it would have meant that. I probably would have struggled a little bit, but actually it was, they encouraged that, you know, when you had characters like Josh Lucy, like Lawrence Dalio, like Alex King, they meant as long as you trained hard and worked hard, you could be your own man. And, um, you know, it was a difficult decision, but I decided to go to, to, to France. Um, I didn't want to play for another premiership club, and I looked at it, and I looked at the offers I had on the table, and I thought, wow, you know, go to play for Paris, the famous Stade Francais, I get to be on the front of a biggest selling gay calendar in the world. Uh, that wasn't really part of the deal. Um, I, I was actually on the calendar, but... Um, <laughs> So I got the calendar, um, you know, to play in a pink shirt, get really in touch with my feminine side, that was, that was integral. Um, and to play with, you know, eight or nine of the best players in the world, you know, Sergio Parise, uh, Dimitri Swarzewski, um, you know, you just had, yeah, unbelievable, I mean, they had, had Hernandez at the time, all these great players. It was, it was a no-brainer, and I went away there for two years. Um, and it could have been, it could have been difficult, because everyone wrote me off, everyone said I went there for money, everyone said this, everyone said that, but I knew if I went there, and I did well, I'd be able to, to come back stronger for England. Um, we had the World Cup, which went really well. And, um, and, then, I had, uh, and then I sort of had um, you know, Japan, which was unbelievable. Um, culturally wise, you know, I went to Japan on my own. I had no, um, sort of no one with me. And uh, you know, obviously all far seem more intelligent than me, but um, you know, based on Latin, you know, European language is based on Latin, so you can kind of get, guess what's going on. <laughs> Japanese, forget it. Uh, I literally had no idea what was going on um, for, for most of the time, but, but unlike France, they supplied translators that, that were with you on the field at all times, went with you everywhere, so, um, which made a massive difference. It wasn't very good for chatting up any women. Either. <laughs> you tell her, I think she's really nice, and then they don't, yeah, I don't think they would translate that because it got me nowhere. Um, and, um, and that was unbelievable. That was the fastest rugby I've ever played. Yeah, I was very lucky, lucky enough to play with Mar Nonu. Now, Mar Nonu, I had no idea. I'd, I'd only seen Mar Nonu from, from playing against him, or what you guys probably think about Mar Nonu. Um, but he turned out to be a, a lovely guy, one of the most generous guys I've ever met. He stitched me up every day. Every day I'd come in, he was a locker next to me. He'd be stealing my clothes. He'd be giving my clothes to other Japanese boys, telling them it was a present. Um, <laughs> he'd, uh, any time I had any food, he'd steal my food. Um, you know, and then he'd, yeah, and he'd just blame me for, for, for everything. Um, and he was sort of the golden guy, because obviously he'd just come out of the World Cup, just won the World Cup, and he was sort of the people's favourite, where I was the, sort of the weird English guy who couldn't really speak any Japanese. Um, but, you know, I think, again, like any environment, when you go into it, you're... Rugby playing does the does the talking, and, and I think they came round. Um, and there's a few other bits, but I can't really go into too much detail about it. Was it um, was it difficult being away from home, away from your family during that time? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very lucky to have extremely supportive parents who you know have always um, made sure that my first priority was always rugby. I think if you're ever going to undertake a, a professional sport, you need that support network about you, you know about you. Whereas my focus could be on. On, on the rugby, you know, if you ever asked me to fill in a tax, tax return or, in fact, do any kind of maths, um, I'd probably be, in, you know, arrested by yeah. now. Um, so, you know, to have that kind of support and to make sure that, my, you know, when I was living at home, that all my clothes and everything were sorted, all that kind of thing, so I could be completely about rugby, they, they were unbelievable. And I'd never, I'd never really been away. Um, I'd been to boarding school, but, you know, that's not quite... You know, it's not like back in the day where, you know, you, your parents dropped you off at the beginning of your term and then, you know, six months later they picked you up. Um, you know, or you sort of saw them every three, you know, three weeks, or they'd come in and watch you play sport. So being going to France was the big step. Um, it was sort of like easing into it. You know, I, I had France, you know, Euro stars so so good that they came over a lot to see me, and friends would come over to see me. But Japan um, was great, and what it taught me being in France was that actually I could stand on my own two feet. That um, when I went away to these places, that actually. Um, taking responsibility and um, stuff for myself got the best out of me because a lot of times when you go to these places like Japan people sign for good money and they can put their feet up they don't perform and it's very easy to get you know in that comfort zone each team has possibly 60 players um, in a squad which is unbelievable you know we, we, at the moment the England squad's probably 32 players a premiership squad so at 40 players you know, 60 players of which only eight of them are professional all the rest of them are office workers um, when I signed, actually, it talked about having me to register for, to work for Rico. Rico, the guys who make the printers, photocopies, everything else. 
and I had to register to be there. And you know, my dad asked the important question, he said, look, well, if James doesn't get picked, does he have to start assembling photocopies in the factory? Whether I get blue ovals, but luckily they assured me I didn't, I didn't have to do that. But a lot of the other guys would have to do that. Um, and the thing is that you could easily get away with you know, putting your feet up there, and I think, as I said, some guys do, but it taught me to make sure that I maintain high standards and whether everyone around me was, was whatever they were doing, I would stand on my own two feet, I would be as professional as I could be, I'd still have the eagerness to learn and that's what it taught me and that I could be, I could be really independent and, um, and it also sort of calmed me down a little bit, you know, you, uh, it taught me that for my day, the makeup of my day, for example at WAS, you know, I've got a lot of business stuff off, off the field, I really enjoy doing stuff outside of rugby. Um, but essentially, you know, when I get to WAS at nine in the morning and I finish at five in the afternoon, my whole life is, is rugby. There's nothing else. I don't allow, I don't pick up my phone to try and email people. I don't do anything else. I wait until that job is done and every box is ticked and then my day, my day starts. And that was very much what I learned doing in Japan. You know, I live 10 minutes around a bike ride. I mean, I had to can the bicycle. They ride everywhere on bicycle, but after about two weeks of doing that, my knees were going to explode. I had like the the most toilet bike you've ever seen. It was um, uh, so I swapped it for a little moped, which I probably wasn't in, even insured on. But I, you know, um, that was great, whizzing backwards and forwards for training. But that taught me to be really, really professional. Put that time in for stretching. Put that time in for diet. Put that time in for extra skills and mm. things like that. You mentioned your business interest just there. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about kind of what you're doing off the pitch and if you've got any plans for, for when you do retire? Yeah, I mean, all my business stuff really started. I mean, I've got my parents to, to thank for a lot of things. I've probably got my parents to blame for a lot of things as well. Um, you know, when I started at, at WAS, um, you know, as a rugby player, you've got a very, very short career. Um, I was um, unfortunately there when Matt Hampson, um, a very good friend of mine, a player, broke his neck when we were playing under 20. So we, he went down for a scrum, he was a prop. Um, he went in, got down, and he never got up again. And he, and he you know, he's made a fantastic um, life out of it. He's done some amazing things. The Matt Hampson Foundation is, is, is incredible. But that just shows you in, in a split second, without being cliched, that can, it can be taken away from you. Um, so I've always tried to do stuff for when I have to finish and also to keep my mind ticking over. So when I first started at WASP, I mentioned to my dad about maybe doing a website or something like that later on. Fortunately, if you tell my father to do anything, it happens like that. Um, and it was only when I came into WASP one day that all the boys like, slow clapped me in. And I was like, right, this isn't good. What have I done here? And um, yeah, and I, basically I found out my old man had created a website for me, um, put on it, you know, obviously unchecked various things about me, but obviously play, you know, playing for WASP and everything else and doing different things. And, and unfortunately, the guys you know, I was outgoing as it was, found me a little bit of an upstart, and we're like, you know, I got a few abusive emails. But many people would send me messages, I can't say the full language they use, but you're a brick, signed Warren Gatland, <laughs> through my, on my message board on the website and everything else like that. And I was like, really, the coach is abusing me, is he? So that was a couple of dark days. Um, but, uh, uh, but I, you know, I managed to ride the banter out, and, and, and yeah, ultimately he was, he was right, because, you know, every player now has, every player now has one, and, and the players who don't, more often not fall behind and it's not about uh, it's like a self-promotion it's, it's if you imagine as a, as a sponsor um, you know if you're a top top player like a Johnny Wilkinson or like a, you know a David Beckham these companies are falling over themselves to do stuff for you but if you're you know way down the pecking order um, and you know it's an avenue of being able to you know help promote their business be able to do things you use it as a good marketing tool and as I said a lot of players have them now um, and that's sort of really where it where it started and from then um, I used to get basically abused for, for spending too much time playing Xbox or, or, or fiddling around and what I realised was that I needed to keep my mind ticking over, that I couldn't, um, that I, I, I tried to read a lot but I couldn't, uh, you know, I was getting bored outside of rugby and I obviously needed to plan for the future so um, I started getting involved and, and as I said my, my, my parents, my, especially my father, worked tirelessly to set up various different things um, for me, you know, we've got a, I really enjoy shooting, I'm lucky enough to sponsor by um, Musto, the shooting the shooting brand and um, I do a lot of shooting we've set up like a corporate shooting business um, well you know it's, it's essentially for anyone mainly for, for you know the old days of the golf day where you go out and play um, and you know if you're no good at golf it's a terrible day you spend all the time in the rough you know you're losing your balls you don't get to have a lot of banter whereas you know in shooting you maybe go out you know with a group of five or six people while, while they're shooting they've got expert in, in, intuition you've got a couple of rugby players you're able to share the banter have a bit of intimate an intimate environment like this as opposed to you know a 600 person dinner so we've got that set up i've actually just launched my own coffee unbelievably is it good it is very good actually yeah yeah it's called um james haskell angry squirrel um yeah yeah i went there yeah yeah where's I, that name come from um well, there's a couple of reasons, actually. I used to call my ex-girlfriend, Angry Squirrel. Um, 
which is one which is one reason. But um, it was basically I was. Um, this is all the power of Twitter. A lot of these things is that uh, Wasp had been going through a few financial problems. Um, we didn't have a coffee machine. And rugby players like a little coffee, to be honest with you, you know, sitting around having a chat in between training, and there wasn't any coffee. So I tweeted, um, you know, any companies out there, we need, we need a coffee machine for the lads, can we sort something out? And this company came back to me, House of Coffees, and they said, um, look, we'll sort you out the coffee machine, we'll sort you out the lads, we're going to need some tweets, pictures, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, do you like a coffee? Yes, we'll make you a, um, a, a limited edition coffee thing for yourself. What's your favourite animal? And everyone always says, oh, a bear or a tiger or a lion or something. And I said, an angry squirrel. <laughs> um, you know, and I sort of envisaged a, a sort of cartoon squirrel that would sort of come running into the room, knock everything down, you know, knock everything over, probably swear at you. You'd have to probably poke it out the corner of the room with the end of a broom, probably bite your finger off and then run out the door. And I sort of came up with this sort of char char um, character for them. And, um, and I said, look, instead of making it for me, why don't we, why don't we sell it? Why don't we um, give some money to charity? Why don't we base it around all the fitness stuff that I'm really into? The fact that it's, um, you know, it's a really nice uh, tasting coffee. It's a blend of sort of five or six beans. That, you know, obviously they're different varieties. Um, make it really high end, but also have a really good caffeine boost. And so you know, obviously you take it in the morning. We wake up. You think, God, I can't bother to train. Take it now before training. Next minute, you're, you know, you're, you're you're in the mix. Is this a future post rugby career in coffee? What, me roasting away, like blending away, yeah. Um, well, in Starbucks, this is, this is the height of my thing. I once spoke at Cambridge, now I'm making lattes. Um, no, I, um, I think for me, things like this are, are really enjoyable because it's something that I can express myself um, through it. I'm able to, 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 uh, to allow someone else to sort of run that, that business for me. I take an active interest. And, and obviously, it's something that you can, you can set up. And if it builds momentum, you know, ideally, it would be about supplying you know, um, gyms and, and, and you know, universities or whatever uh, with something that's really tasting you know, great but also gives you that sort of that lift. So that's one sort of section of the, 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 the business but it's all basically for me built around um, fitness and health. Um, I'm really big into my, to my training. Um, I mean there's very rarely a photo of me with my clothes on um, uh, out there and a lot of that's to do with sort of doing the, the, the training and, and, and workouts and everything else. And, I've sort of developed a fitness blog that I'm turning into a proper website and obviously with the caffeine boost and all that kind of mentality, um, there's lots of things that are going to fit onto that. I'm doing some stuff with my own supplement range which will come out which is um, going to be quite exciting and we'll just see where we go. It's all built around there so eventually when I finish playing I can transition straight into to running any one, of those, any one of those businesses but I'd like to try and maybe go into to TV or something else once I finish. Obviously you've still got a few years left in rugby. What so far including your Indian career, any club career, would you say has been the best moment? Is that New Zealand victory up there? Yeah, it's got to be up there. I've never beaten a Southern Hemisphere side. Um, I was um, in uh, Australia when, on the bench when we beat them over there and I didn't come on, um, which was gutting. You know, I was the only player who didn't come on and everyone's high-fiving and celebrating and you, know, you feel like a real spare part. So that was a, that was a big blow for me. Um, so to get the opportunity to, to sit in... Um, and, and come on against New Zealand and, and win like we did so emphatically was, 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 was great. So that's up there. I think making my England debut, you know, you can't undervalue that time you get that phone call. You know, the first time I get called up in England was actually under Brian Ashton. It was only because um, someone else in the squad told me that I realise. You know, now it's very much people pick up the phone and call you. It was only because someone said to me, oh, house, congratulations, you're in the England squad. And I said, am I? And they said, yeah, your name's on the bottom of one of the emails. And I was like, Brilliant. That's that's my sort of you know you want a big big climax, but unfortunately that was um, that was all I got. So I got called up there and, and to play against Wales at the Millennium Stadium was um, you know for me one of the most special moments in my life, especially because uh, the Welsh are so passionate. Um, all through the age group rugby I played, we'd always had such a battle with the Welsh. They were always the most physical. They really had the most hatred for, for the English. And I, I think if you talk about um, I mean people, the weird thing I say is for, for, an, Eng for an England player, I have no. I don't, you know, people, I have no problems with Scottish people, I don't even think of it like that, it's not for me, it's not, it's about going out and playing and whoever you play, you're going to get a physical battle, it's, it's irrelevant, but I think especially age group sides, especially in Wales, Wales and Scotland, the, these things are really hammered home by their coaches, you know, that they bring it up and you speak to some of the Welsh players and they're always talking about, you know, the English this, arrogant that, blah, 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 and um, they, you know, they're really cabers, and you know, when you're a sort of a posh schoolboy running around, uh, under 19, you know, you're getting filled in by a Welsh guy. It's not really, you know, it sort of wakens you up, you know, wakens you up a little bit. And I think um, playing Wales at the Millennium Stadium was, was was amazing for me. The fact that they play with the the, the roof closed as well. Now people always say, 
um, how much does the crowd play a part? Now, we all watch the Olympics, um, and you know that they always talk about how great the crowd was and how important that was as the extra motivator. But in rugby, you know, we have good crowds, but we don't have the football chance like you know, uh, you know, obviously in football. Um, and the crowd make noise, but in uh, yeah, sorry, football and tennis. Um, and a um, and yeah, and they sort of make a, a a big point of that. When rugby, you know, it can it can fluctuate, but in that Millennium Stadium, when they close the roof, the noise is so loud, it becomes oppressive. It literally feels like someone's pushing down on you and we were I think it was 15 12 and we were 10 meters from the try line their try line and they were going mental and it was so loud it almost like you can't concentrate it affects your balance affects everything and for me to sort of make my debut in that cauldron was yeah as I said was amazing so that was one of the highs what's the biggest regret from your career <sighs> how long we got um, I think uh, I think it's difficult um, I, I sometimes wish that, um, you know, some persona-wise, um, you know, I've always been an outgoing guy, I've always been um, myself, my character and everything else, and I've always been really, really hard-working uh, and, and made sure that um, I left no stone unturned in the pursuit of being professional. But I've also been very outgoing with that, and, and, and sometimes that gets perceived as um, in, in a negative light, and it's, it's difficult because people who know me and people who know the way I work and, and the, the coaches I know, um, and, the, and the different clubs I played. If I was a, you know, if I was, um, you know, supremely arrogant, if I was um, not focused, you know, you would have seen one of these teams come out and say something. But no, it's always the same thing. The coaches are always very, very complimentary. Always enjoy working with me, and the guys, you know, get on, get on well. And I think sometimes if I do things differently, um, it w would probably be a little bit more um, restrained in my sort of earlier, earlier years because I think people do a lot of stuff on hearsay. Um, but I think. Playing-wise, I don't really have many regrets. I've enjoyed everything I've done. There's games that you wish you'd done better on. That you know, I, I, I gutted. I missed the last Lions tour. I think for me that was a real, a real opportunity. Um, and you know, I, at the time I, I wasn't playing good, you know, well enough in that Six Nations to, to warrant it. But that was a big blow for me. Uh, I think missing out in 2007 in the World Cup to do all the training um, was difficult. I remember. With that, I got uh, Lawrence Delalio at the time went to, went to the World Cup, and he had an injured knee, and he hadn't trained. We'd been on an army camp, we'd done everything. We hadn't, he hadn't trained for sort of three or four weeks. I thought, look, they're never going to take him. He hasn't played. And I got a phone call one afternoon. I picked it up, and he's like, Haskell Delalio here, come to room three four five. And I was like, okay, sweet. I'll go up and see what he wants. Rolled in, and he um, and he goes right. Order us up an afternoon tea. So I said, okay, no problem, Lawrence. So we'll order up an afternoon tea for him. And he goes, he sat there sort of cross legged. He went, and Brian Ashton was the coach at the time. He goes, I've had a chat with Brian. We're thinking about taking you to the World Cup. And I was like, sorry, what? We're you, we're thinking about taking you to the World Cup. Don't you, don't you mean Brian's thinking about? It? No, I've had a chat with him. We don't want Nick East to go and ask you're the man. I'll look after you. Like basically ruffled me on the hair gave me a scone and, and shoved me out the door. Um, and, uh, and yeah, lo and behold, um, he went to the World Cup and, and then Whitney Keister went to the World Cup and I was, um, I was left at home. And that was a big blow for me because I really thought I was going well. I thought it was a great opportunity. And that can, you know, having made my England debut playing against France, the World Cup, it was another, you know, four or five months before I got to put that, that white shirt on. And no one wants to be a one cat wonder and no one wants to sit around. Even though it's a great achievement, you always just want to get off the mark. Talked about Brian Ashton there, that takes me on nicely to my next question, which is how does how does Stuart Lancaster for, for firstly compare to the previous managers you've played on and just talk us through the different kind of styles under Johnson and Ashton? Um, I mean I'll start with Stuart. I mean he for, for me um, he's you know a really, really um, sort of excellent sort of man manager, a really understands what it takes to, to, to be involved in, in, in professional rugby. I think the atmosphere that he's created. You know, there's no question of passion. After the World Cup, every newspaper you, you read was full of people questioning England's passion. You know, were we on a stag do X, Y, and Z? No, that was never the that was never the case. Everyone wanted to perform for, for England, and and everyone was working as hard as they hard as they could. But I think what what Stuart's done is he's come in, he's reinvigorated everyone. Um, he's put the best coaches in place to make the um, to, to 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 make the side successful. Um, he's you know made sure that everyone knows the value of the shirt, and I think he's taken a little bit of that. New Zealand mentality, but indirectly, that you know the shirt, the England shirt, is 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 not really yours. You've got it for a short period of time, and it's only you know you've got a very short life expectancy on it. There's always someone knocking on the door, and that he will pick the players that are the best. 
he will um, he, he wants a competitive environment he understands um, and he'll look under you know he'll turn every stone to try and find the answer and solution and provide everything for the players to do their best and ultimately he wants guys who are team men and he won't accept anything else and at the moment there's a really really good environment being there like you know it's a sad thing to say but sometimes um, a little while ago it, you know going on England camp you were a little bit like I want to play I care about playing for England I want to play for England but the training and everything else it's going to drag on we're going to be you know knocking you know seven bells out of each other all day um, you know it's a bit mindless there's not a lot of structure there isn't a big end game you know there's question marks over some of the the, the stuff that's going on but 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 ultimately now that's completely different and, and guys are looking forward to it guys are you know chomping at the bit to get out there and train and, and I think he's great um, just moving forward slightly well we're going to talk about rugby generally for a while um, do you think the the impact of money on the sport has has changed it and is that positively or negatively and sort of have you seen things with you know the French league as I've talked about as having more more investment in it and players going abroad to play um, obviously football has been is, is the kind of the archetypal sport that's been impacted by money do you fear rugby going in that direction or is it something that we should be looking to, to have more of what football the devil everyone, everyone football hates the devil. football the devil yeah um, no I think rugby f has been advanced and enhanced by having more money in it. I think it, you know, what the guys are asked to do week in, week out in terms of their uh, putting their bodies on the line, um, you know, that attritional 30 games a season where you know, an injury can mean that you, you, know, you might not be able to walk again, let alone do anything else. I think it's important the guys are enumerated for that. I think it's got to reflect the, the interest. But the reason football's so powerful is because it, it's the national sport. You could fill Old Trafford you know, twice over every week. You, you know, you've got premiership clubs who you know are getting six thousand every every week you know in ten thousand seater stadiums and it and that's where it becomes a little bit difficult but i think it has been greatly enhanced i think the problem with rugby has is that um it's only become professional uh, i think it's maybe the last 15 years or, or maybe a bit longer now but that's a very short period of time and there's still guys who were playing who didn't get paid great amounts of money who um remember what it was like in the old days and those guys come out and comment and if you go against the norm which was you know, rugby players, they had normal jobs, they were very understated, they never said anything, it was a big hierarchy system involved, um, you had to earn your spurs, you had to do everything. Now that's changed. Now the fact that you know, there's a big commercial element coming into the sport, that players are expected to do things that, we've, that you know, taking part in appearances, um, doing stuff with brands is, is, all, is all essential to the game because it, it's a living, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, as a rugby player you're a commodity and a lot of the old guard still get rattled by that, um, that mentality and will certainly choose you know, players and pick players out and, and you know, talk about this and that but as they slowly fade away um, this new sort of generation that will come through uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll keep advancing it. I think it's important that the values of rugby stay the same which is that, that ultimate respect for, for authority that the club um, are managed very differently from football that I think um, you know when you've got players who go out and cause havoc and then and then the, you know the, the, the coach turns around and says oh I didn't see it or I didn't know about it that for me just breeds that mentality of no accountability and people entitled to do what they like whereas in rugby you know, you're very much managed by the, the players around you people will expect you to do certain things and there's a, there's a real high level and um, you know and I think as well the more the rugby develops the more it becomes um, available to everyone and then the popularity will grow because it is a great game you know you don't get a nil all draw in rugby but very rarely you do you know I mean there's things some classic wasps Worcester games like 6-3 but apart from that you know you you, you normally get an exciting thing someone's going to get smashed someone's going to score a try and that, you know I think that popularity will grow and I think when more money gets into it more investment will come and now with the sevens in the Olympics you know if the Americans pick up and run with rugby I know they've got um, They've got the US Eagles, and they've got it all, but over there, compared to all their other sports, you know, for any of you who follow American sport, it's just done, I mean, college, you know, college uh, American football gets 100,000 people, 6,000 people, you know, rugby players don't get that on a, on a, you know, even at a Twickenham game. And that kind of uh, atmosphere, if that could translate to rugby for this next Olympics, then it would, you know, I'd like to be a young player being involved in the sport because, you know, there's, there's no glass ceiling on, on how well you could do. You mentioned you just touched on American football. I read recently that Obama said he'd have to think very carefully about his son playing American football because it's not considered to be safe. Have you got any concerns about the safety of rugby now? And if you had a son, would you encourage them to play? Yeah, I would definitely encourage my, my, my children to, to... I've got to find a missus first, but I, um, I would definitely encourage my, um, 
my children if I had them to, to, to play rugby because I think, again, it's not just um, the physical sport. It's everything that comes with rugby. It's the, it's the camaraderie with the guys. It's that, that banter. It's you know, playing in a team sport. Um, and learning to, to, to do that individual sport, I've got ultimate respect because you know, when things don't go well, if you're having an off day, you've normally got 14 players around you to pick you up. You know, when Andy Murray goes out the court, you know, he's fighting himself and he's fighting the, you know, his, his opposition, and that's a very lonely place out there. Um, the only thing I can imagine it was when I was at school, I was in goal, and most of the time I was picking the ball out my own net, and it's a very lonely place to be out there on your own. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for, for, for me, uh, rugby is. Um, it is very, very physical, and I think it's still going up on that physical trend. The problem is, like anything, it's going to have to plateau because you can't continue to have that, that size development. You know, I started my career um, and was very much focused on size and strength. I came off a conveyor belt where the mentality was size and strength was the key. Whereas in New Zealand, and that's what I learned, especially over there, was that their first um, thought is to pick up the rubber ball and play it. They'd much rather play touch, everyone plays touch, kids go out and play touch. Whereas you know, a lot of people um, are more, in the UK certainly, are more focused on size. And I think that's got to change. You know, out in South Africa in the, uh, in the, the summer tour, I looked at the England on the 20s program, and almost their entire pack was 120 kilos, which is bigger than the, the, bigger than the starting um, England side. So I think that's, you know, it's going to keep going for a while, but then it's going to change, and people will go back to... Um, that running rugby mentality, and that it'll be more about it will more about sort of speed, agility, um, and that will change. And I think American football, people talk about American football as you know, they I've met a few American footballers. They go, man, you play rugby, you must be crazy. That was an American accent, by the way. Um, <laughs> and um, they go, you know, man, you're crazy. But I have to completely disagree. In rugby, I pretty much know where I'm going to get hit from. But you know, if I'm running against you, I pretty much know where you're going to come from. In American football, I could be facing that way, and two people could come from any angle and chop me from, from, from behind. Plus, they're wearing helmets. And um, you know, if you're wearing a helmet, you're, you're just more inclined to, to, to fly in with your head. You've got no problems. And guys get rattled all the time. They have massive problems with a concussion. You know, I wear a scrum cap. And you know, if I didn't put my scrum cap on I, in the heat at the moment, I'd always be able to play. But ultimately, I put, I put it on because I, I've got to put my head where you don't really want to put it. You know, I want to tackle guys around the knees. I've got to clear you know, massive guys out. You've got to get underneath them. You've got to go head on head sometimes, and it's not, not great. But American football, is, for me, is, is far more dangerous than rugby will ever be. And I think with, with rugby, they've reached the, the limit on padding. I don't think we need any more. We've got shoulder pads. Guys, you know, some guys wear shin guards. Um, you know, you've got arm guards. But any more, and it, it'll get ridiculous. And we can't talk about the future of rugby without obviously talking about the, the 2015 World Cup. What effect is having that going to have on English rugby? Well, I mean, if it was um, anything like the Olympics, it'll be, you know, stratospheric. I think uh, when, you know, f with the Olympics, I was out of the country for, 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 for most of the build-up to it, and what I saw of it was standard English thing. Oh, no one wants it. Uh, you know, we don't want it. We, you know, we, we're gonna, it's going to be a tombola, and it's going to be like Morris dancing, and, you know, it's going to be terrible, and, and everything else. And obviously the Olympics started, and then... It was the best thing since sliced bread. Everyone said, I told you we should have had the Olympics. And everyone's talking about legacy, and all the politicians are panically trying to rebuy all the training fields they sold off. Um, and I think with the, with, the, with the World Cup sort of following that Olympic spirit, everyone's going to go into it. And, and it's almost a fear where ever, they'll try and over-egg it, because they want it to be a success. There's so much pressure to recapture that. But rugby, for me, in England, will will definitely benefit. I think grassroots rugby will benefit, and no doubt they'll put on a spectacular affair. And the Six Nations and all this kind of stuff is just a precursor. That momentum will build, because as the entity of rugby develops much more into a, a commercial monster, by the time you reach 2015, hopefully every corner of, of the UK will be will rugby orientated and that people were crying out. You know, we've, we've lashed up so many times in the Football World Cup that even the most die-hard supporters get a little bit sick. If, rugby, if England can, can do that in the Rugby World Cup at home, do well, then it'll be unstoppable. I think finally there'll be that final transition from, from football to rugby. And you mentioned there the, the pressure that's put on you by the media, and you talked before about the kind of caricature and some of the things that are, that are written about you by people who have probably never met you. What is your, your kind of overall experience as a professional rugby player dealing with the media? Is it something that's just a, a kind of a necessity of the job, or is it actually something that you, you genuinely end up resenting? I mean, I watched Prince Harry's um, interview the other day when he came back from, from Afghanistan, and uh, now he, you know, he's obviously in a completely different level to, to, to all of us, but 
that scrutiny and the fact that you know, things get written and you know he has to deal with it is his part and part of his life is very much you know on a very 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 smaller scale to what we have to put up. You know, it, it, it's integral to to the sport. It's something that you're obliged to do, um, and it can be extremely frustrating. Um, you know, I sort of learned very early on. I think as everyone does uh, from making mistakes. You know. Uh, I put when I um, didn't get put in the England squad um, for, for when I went to France. I think I put something on Twitter in my early days, Twitter, something like, oh, you know, very disappointed, looking to, you know, I see it as a challenge, looking to dominate that challenge and go away. I, you know, I thought it was pretty innocuous, but then they take it, spin it round. Haskell says he wants to dominate England, wants to do this, wants to do that, and that can be very frustrating. Um, and I think especially as well with uh, we were actually talking about it in the car on the way up here. You know, a, a lot of journalists um, when they write. Uh, stuff and they put the story together but then the sub editor comes along and sticks some ridiculous headline over the top of it and as a rubber player that's a nightmare because um, you know you're with your teammates if you I mean Alex Goode actually um, has recently did a piece about Daley Thompson saying that Daley Thompson is a massive inspiration for him um, that he's the most expensive item he has in his house is a photograph of Daley, uh, of Daley Thompson that while others were resting uh, Goody was running through the snow and he couldn't see any other footprints because he was on his own fighting against the world, training harder than anyone. Right, and this bloke's obviously spiced this article up massively, so to the much to the point that now um, Alex is known as um, Daily Goode. That's what he's been nicknamed as um, for the whole time. And, and that could be quite disruptive because he, you know, boys are getting into him the whole time, people are obviously texting him, criticising him, and that's just a, you know, a, no, a no sense um, article. So as a player, you really have to adopt it. You've got to do it because if you try and resent it and fight them, they're always going to win. You can never win against a journalist. I mean, I got interviewed by a, a chap before here, you know, and he, I think he thought he was possibly writing for the Sun, but he writes for the Tap. I don't know. I don't get, I don't get the deliver, but he, he, was, he was, I thought he was a hard, hit, hard hitting man, and he was asking some deep questions. So, no doubt, it'll be interested to see what he spins my, my answers to. But, but you know, you know there'll be a ma probably massive scandal, Cambridge scandal, never invited back. But, um, <laughs> But you know that's the, that that is that's the point is that guys are open to interpretation and the, and the worst thing about um, for me the internet is it gives a voice to people who really don't deserve it and I don't and, and I don't I I I, I, I mean that and I'm, I mean that talking about the tap or what no, no 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 I, I don't, yeah I don't know if he's online um, <laughs> but he um, I th think. F f f the, the real important thing is that if you look at you know websites like the Daily Mail. Everyone who reads the Daily Mail, everyone hates the Daily Mail, yet everyone's secretly reading it, You're looking at the gossip and everything else, and the whole thing is geared to that, to that celebrity culture and everything else. But if you look at the comments, 286 comments, all these keyboard warriors have come out of nowhere, and they're all, you know, uh, you know Sharon from North Hans thinks, <laughs> you know, this is terrible, appalling, and everything else. And, and as a player, um, you know, I wrote a column for The Guardian, and it was in a difficult period of time when um, England weren't doing so well. There was a lot of problems with discipline on the field, guys getting yellow carded. Now, you know, as a player, I don't want to turn around and say, you know, point people out. It's a very difficult thing because if you say something too uh, inflammatory, that's the headline. If you don't say anything else, it's boring. So you come up with what you think is a rounded view and, and you then look at the comments and people are literally, they're insulting your family, they're offering you out in the car park, you know, you, you should never play again. And, and then you, you know, and I make a point at some of these journalists. If I mean, that's not the journalist commenting, but sometimes journalists who say bad things, I'll go and meet them and put, a, you know, put a, 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 a no, yeah, no. <laughs> my old man, my old man keeps the car running. I run in, shank them, and then we're out, we're off again. No, I, 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 at media days, I'll go and, you know, find them out and say to them, you know, hi, I'm I'm James Haskell. Put a put a fa you know face to a name because you're not so anonymous. You know, if someone wants to to, to mug you off. And, and stab you in the back. It's very difficult when they have that accountability of actually meeting that person. And, and, and lo and behold, I think, as we talked about earlier, when people meet you, they're not so brave and bold. You know, I mean, a guy, a, guy in the world, a guy in the World Cup wrote some very bad things and was very, very, um, very cheap with his comments. It was just appalling journalism, but just so easy, very salacious. And I spotted him straight away, and I just rolled up straight and talked to him and said, look, you know, you, this and this is wrong. Oh, blah, blah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, this and this is wrong. He literally, you know, he was backpedaling. He was like the Italian army. He had, one, you know, one, <laughs> one forward gear and 17 reverse gears. He was like back over the hill before we'd even started, you know? Yeah. Last question, James. You talked about just, you sort of finished on a bit of a negative note there, but um, have you ever regretted what you did? Have you ever wondered why have I got into rugby and wish you did anything else? 
Um, I sort of fall in, I fell into rugby, really. Uh, as I said, I never wanted to be a rugby player. I actually, to my parents' horror, wanted to be a digger driver. Um, driving a JCB would be perfect with the Sun magazine just tucked down the, uh, the, front, of the, the front of the cab. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it was a big waste of a public school education, so I would have been forced at gunpoint into the city or to do something else like that. But I don't ever regret playing rugby at all. I think I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged uh, to do it. You know, I signed a two year contract on my sort of 18th birthday. Um, I sat down, it was at a Chinese restaurant, bizarrely enough, um, and I sat down and signed my, signed my contract. Um, and I said, look, you know, I'll defer my university entry. Unfortunately, it wasn't to Cambridge. I think it was some polytechnic or something, or the Open University. Um, no, I'm joking, it was probably here. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I deferred it, you know, saying that oh, what I do is if I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go to university in a couple of years, I'll give this rugby a crack, see how I get on. Ten years later, I'm, I'm still, still here, um, always with the thought that you know, if I can't play for England anymore, if I can't play at the top level, then I'll, and I'll pack it in and go and do something else. And, and, and that's why I developed so much stuff off the field and try to never get on my Xbox, uh, you know, again. We have got a bit of time for questions, so if James is happy to take them, which I think he is. Is there anyone anything they'd like to ask, James? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think Billy's a, you know, he's such a good player. He's, he's a young player that, um, interesting enough, I didn't realise how much of rugby he played at. This has been in Vanapolu, who's leaving London, who's leaving London was to go to Saracens. Um, he, he was at Harrow um, on, a, on a scholarship, and his first year I think he played um, a lot. And then his second year, I think to sort of Harrow's disgust, he, he spent most of the season playing with London Wasps. He was still at school and um, doing what I do, but actually playing in the regular Premiership season and playing unbelie you know, unbelievably well. He's 130 kilos of, of a man, and he got a sort of a, a great rap and developed. So he was a real wasps, wasp man. I mean, I actually asked him, did he ever play for Harrow? And he said, I played one game, and, like, and he just went, like, laughed, got a cheeky laugh. He said, listen, bro, I scored three tries. It's so easy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> he goes, I could have I caught five, but it wasn't even fair. So, you know, so he, he, he was, um, he's a great loss for wasps. Uh, but I can understand why he's going. You know, I think Saracens are a club with... with um, Great financial security. Uh, they've got three, um, three sort of um, very wealthy owners. They've got a good structure behind them. Um, you know, his brother's there. And I think, unfortunately, at the time when his contract was being negotiated, I think obviously there was sort of issues with, with, with Wasps off the field, which has all been sorted out now. And I, you can't blame him for making that decision. If he wants to go where, to a club that, even though Wasps have done fantastic well, and I believe that what Di Young's doing, Wasps will be a force um, to come with all the young talent they've got. Um, that you can't blame him for, for, for going across. So what everyone's, everyone's saying, you know, the thing with what I love about Wasps fans or rugby fans in general is when I left to go to Stade Francais, there's a motto at Wasps. Uh, Once a Wasp, always a Wasp. And everyone sort of bans this out every, you know, all the time. Until you leave Wasps and then, you know, you were never a Wasp, don't ever speak to me again. Um, I'll probably drive over you in the car park as, I, as I'm leaving. So I left London Wasps and everyone was putting the knife in, as they're probably doing with Billy, all the fans, you know, saying all these sort of things about you. And then, you sign back for them. Oh, welcome back! How are you? We've missed you. You can get a white wine spritzer, you need a massage, all this kind of stuff. They're all, you know, they're all your best of friends as ever you were. So, as a player, you've got to remember that you are a commodity. That if you stop playing well or you get injured, you will be replaced. And you've got to make sure you make an informed decision. That goes for anything in life. You've got to do what's best for you and for those around you. And I think Billy. You know, I think he could have stayed at Wasps and made a massive success of it. I think at Saracens he'll go there. I think quality will, will reign out. It's very sad, and, and, I, and I wish him all the best. Um, I'm talking about the World Cup. Um, Do you? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Stadium, stadium career, which is rugby stadium. Only one of which does the I mean, I actually hadn't looked too much at the, 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 the detail of the, of the, um, the way the, the stadiums were displayed. But, I, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you've got to play it at, at, at the big ones. And I think you've got to maximise the, um, in the key, you know, the key areas, the key cities, really take it around the country. But if those facilities aren't there, then you've got to look to develop. 
especially in you know in New Zealand they took the World Cup and they, sh they shared it with uh, New Zealand Australia a little while ago because Aust New Zealand wasn't prepared to hold it. New Zealand went away, developed the stadiums and put on a, on a, on a great experience and I think certainly in, in the UK the way the Olympics did with the torch going around the country and everyone buying into it, you've got to put rugby around the country, if the stadiums aren't there you've got to develop it and if the stadiums um, are there is play games like at Old Trafford, play games at Wembley, play games at all these big fantastic stadiums we've got around the country because as you say you've got to leave a legacy there, there's no point erecting a fake one or doing something you know, like they did in the Olympics, you've got to have something that will, that will help rugby and hopefully if the World Cup goes well then you'll be able to fill those stadiums. Well, we'll take two at a time, one there and then one at the back there. I think there's always going to be a change of uh, perspective. You know, things go around in cycles. Um, a lot of what's what's in vogue, what's not in vogue. And I think the one thing that you, you, you've got to look at the Super 15 is, is that um, that ability with the ball, um, the, the real focus on, on getting young players not to be robots, not to come off that conveyor belt, um, it, it is really important. I think the more coaches that go over there, the more players that go over there, that sort of gets translated back into the UK. And um, I think uh, as well, you've got to look at the, the makeup and the way their season goes. You know, Super 15, the guys who play for New Zealand, you know, will play those sort of 18 games in the Super 15, and then be playing the All Blacks games. They don't play the same level of the same amount of rugby as we play, um, which I think is a big, big factor in how they play, how they prepare, the kind of intensity they have. Because the season I found over in, in Super 15 was was very professional, but was what I imagine rugby was like 10 years ago in the UK. It was about a set of 15 guys who were fruit mates going out on the field. They'd have a beer after the game. They'd all the opposition, South African, Australian, would come into our change room or vice versa, depending on where we were. Sit down, you'd meet your opposite man, you'd have a drink with him, you'd have a chat with him. Uh, you'd get to know them and you'd go away. And everyone knew everyone because of the size of, of New Zealand. And I really think that um, because they're able to look up to their heroes and because rugby is their national sport, you've got kids picking up a rugby ball and going out and playing and want to pass in the UK. Kids are either watching you know, reality TV and wanting to be the you next know, Joey Essex or they're kicking a football around in the playground. They don't have that same sort of mentality, I don't think. There's one at the back as well. It's <sighs> a very good question. Um, but you know what I'd go for? Um, I'd, I'm, I, well, I'd go for pancakes to start, probably. Um, and then I have sausage and mash. Uh, an onion gravy, and I'd finish with oh, uh, sticky toffee pudding and like a caramel sauce. Probably coffee after eight mints, a small cognac, and a big cigar, and then that would yeah, <laughs> that would do me that would do me sweet, yeah. But I'm not advocating smoking, so no to drugs, okay? Oh no, a little more over there. I don't, um, I don't really hate anyone. Um, there's guys that you're very, very competitive against that you're always pitted against, you know, so for, for the Irish team. I mean, if I get tweeted one more time about how much better Sean O'Brien is than me and those kind of things, and it's many of my, many of my friends tweet me that. Um, you know, I think there's guys you look forward to playing against. I think, you know, the, the French back row's got um, people like Pickamoles, you know, he's a great ball carrier, you want to you challenge yourself against him. You know, in Ireland, you've got Heaslip and, and Sean O'Brien and Ferris. You know, they're great players, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of lion contenders. Um, you know, Wales, you've got Sam Warburton. For me, I would always target the, the, the back row guys. Um, and I think it's always just about rising to that challenge that when you're out there on the, on the field, that you, you either shy away from these things or you try and, and raise the bar. And I don't, I don't spend a lot of time looking at the opposition I'm, I'm playing against in terms of you know, worrying about them, whatever. We do analysis, I respect them, I'll look at number eight, work out which hand he carries the ball in when he breaks off the scrum, etc, etc. But otherwise I don't really worry too much about it because it's about enforcing yourself in your own performance. And I think that's the one thing that England has really done is a lot of time we spent our time worrying about the South Africans, New Zealand, when under Stuart, you know, we respect every opposition, we realise how good each team is, but we, we were confident in ourselves and work very much on our game, and if we can impose our game on an opposition, invariably your, things will go your way. got time for a few more. Has anyone else got There's one in the balcony? We'll take two at times if you say, and then just the one there. Um, just, just, just take it over there. And the one there as well. Uh, 
I'll answer your first one. The, the, yeah, I, I think I, I've got to agree with the, the Heinen Cup. I don't understand why. Um, I mean, first, let me start. The Heinen Cup is the premier club tournament in the world. It's the best, it's the best tournament. It has the most exciting rugby, and I, I think it's a real foundation. If you play high level Highland Cup rugby, it's, you know, Test rugby is probably 10% above that, but it's, you know, it's, it's up there and it's great. And, and to win it, I was lucky enough to win it with London Wasps and to be involved in that game, and that's one of the pinnacles of my, of my career. I think, in terms of the, what you're saying, yeah, I, I think you can't have automatic qualifications. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's fair. I think if teams have to compete, I think they've got to bring in a structure, which means that. Um, there is fair allocation of slots, and that, and that yeah, I think it'll be disappointing, but I, I doubt that it, that will continue. Even if it's reformatted in another tournament, there needs to be a European tournament, and it needs to be fair. And if you're not, you know, you can't just be, have automatic qualification because teams who aren't very good, for example, the, uh, the, the sort of the, um, it's not the Magnus League now, what's it called, the, the, the Rabideau League or whatever that they play in, they, you know, a lot of teams, you'll see, you know, Leinster will put out two teams. They'll have one team that they play week in, week out, and they'll have the one Heineken Cup team. And these guys are getting two or three weeks rest. They're getting the best conditioning. They're optimum, you know, they're, they're at their optimum to go out and play the Heineken Cup. And that's why I think English teams struggle sometimes, because you put your best teams out um, consistently, and I think that's got to change. Um, your question, worst injury. Uh, touch wood. And they put the, the curse on me. I hate answering this question. Um, I haven't had any two major ones. I've got a screw in my wrist. Um, from actually scoring a try, I think it was such a shock to the body that my, um, <laughs> my wrist crumbled away. Um, and um, so I've got a screw in there. Um, I've got tendonitis in my knees, but other than that, I'm, I'm battling on. And I've got a horrible strut, but that's just the hereditary thing. I don't, you know, it's not because it's not I've raped myself. I just got, I got a lot of stick. People always ask me if they want fruit in my bowl, but that's, you know. <laughs> got time for two more, two last questions. One there. Any final one? No. Oh, go one at the back as well. Uh, you're stuck in the back. Can we get a translator? What was that? <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. I, I was stuck in a what? I was stuck in a Greenland. I was stuck in an island. Who would it be? <sighs> See, straight away you'd say, oh, you want a couple of lads, you know, I'd take like Danny Kerr or Chris Ashton, but Ashton would drive me mad. I'd have to show him how to like cut the coconuts up, how to like get him off. Bear, I think his island will have coconuts on, just to let you know. Um, I think it'd be the whole time, and he, yeah, he'd be quite difficult. I think I'd have to take someone who's fairly cerebral. It would be quite good. Um, I think I'd take Danny Care just for, 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 for banter value as well. And, and, um, I'm trying to think who else I would take. I think I'd probably take my, my best friend, Paul Doran Jones, as well, just to keep me level headed. He's quite an intelligent guy. He did medicinal medicinal chemistry at Trinity, so if I need a little bit of focus, he, he can help me. Which players would you least like to be on a desert island? <laughs> I, mean, there's a f I mean, there's a few players that I think um, guys who get a little bit of bad rap, but I think would be quite, quite painful. who are quite painful on the field, so like Pat Sanderson's quite painful. He doesn't play anymore, but I think he'd be quite difficult to, to sit on the island with. Um, but guys in the England squad, they're all actually, they're all these top boys. I think there's some people that I'd probably drive, drive a little bit mad. Sometimes I make a joke and the first couple of times they sort of laugh and at the end of it they've got a real tight smile. They're sort of like, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to pretend to laugh. Um, I think probably one of the Leicester boys uh, would, would struggle. I think Doug Davy Wilson, um, he's a lovely guy, but I, put, you know, I don't think I could put up with that Newcastle accent the whole time. Um, i trying to think of who else. <sighs> it's a tricky one. I'll say Brad Barrett. But he's a lovely guy as well, but probably Brad just that's African accent. Fair enough. And there's one last question in the corner at the back. I think it's a, oh, that's a great question. Um, the problem is that I don't think it's got to the, I think, I don't think it's got to the, the, the level where it, it's inhibiting um, young players coming through. Uh, there is a problem, I think, a lot of times with young players in uh, premiership clubs not getting um, time enough to, to play games. But at the moment, with the LV Cup, you know, as a player, you think, why do we want another tournament? You know, we're playing enough rugby. But actually, those LV Cup are, are, are great for young players' development. I think the A-League is, is really important. And now there's a lot of a loan system where guys go out to, to different clubs. And I think that's really important that that maintains because 
in, in, in rugby and, and from what I can gather from professional sport, you know, every year that goes by and every opportunity you think you've got it cracked, you think, right, now I'm comfortable in this, in this arena. The next year comes around, you look back and go, cool, I had no idea, now I know, and it keeps going through. And, and I really don't think that, that, that having an influx of foreign players has got, um, has got out of hand. I think one thing that is a little bit inhibiting at the moment, and I think that will continue, depending on how, what happens, because you know, the state of the European economy and everything, I'm not sure how it's going to be maintained, but these players going over across to France, you know, they just can't compete. I think that's more of a more of an issue. You know, I, I went across there, and there was a you know, there was a, a difference, uh, but not not drastic. And some you know some clubs in the UK, you know, offered more, but from, certainly from some of the players going, the volumes and levels they're talking about, you just can't do it under that salary cap. And I mean, there are some clubs, not mentioning any names in the UK, who who you know have got guys on the book for books for sixty grand, and their wife's employed as a secretary for three hundred fifty grand you know, once a week, or a car park attendant. So there's a few, you know, there's obviously a little bit of something going on, but I think that's the biggest problem, is, is the French market. Thank you, James, for, for such an interesting, enjoyable talk. Um, can we give James a massive thank you for coming? <laughs>